Hi, my name is Dr. Nishant Yagnik. I'm a senior consultant in neurosurgery. And today I'll be giving you a broad overview on the management of a neurosurgical patient in the emergency. Now, why have I chosen this particular topic? Because it is the basic topic through which multiple spokes of knowledge uh, emerge in the neurosurgical spectrum. It is. It has many concepts which are both practical for practical management as well as for the theoretical aspects of ICP management that you need to know. Also, it is the basic requirement of uh, for a neurosurgical resident and it is the most common topic that is asked in your uh, vivas. Now, we have been through a COVID phase in which there are no vivas, but rest assured, vivas will start very soon, I'm sure, particularly for institutions like PGI Chandigarh and Ames, both I've given vivas for uh, during my time. And this is the most common uh, topic that is discussed among them. That is why it is also MCQ heavy. It's a very MCQ heavy topic. And it is this topic has been given the greatest weightage in general surgery textbooks that cover neurosurgery, including Schwartz and Sebastian. And uh, it is both has both theoretical and practical concepts. So you need to be uh, able to answer very uh, confidently uh, when you're asked questions on this, as well as when you're asked uh, MCQs on this topic. So what I'll do is I'm going to tell you what this, how this topic can be covered in a very nice and succinct way. It's a short presentation. So we can go on to uh, an understanding uh, how this actually relates to a significant chunk of neurosurgery. So basically the topic is covered in different scenarios. As a neurosurgeon, you will be given a call from the emergency and they will tell you, sir, we have a patient of uh, this particular problem. We have a patient of this particular problem. So broadly, the kind of patients that will be brought to you are of four types. The first and foremost will be a patient with a history of head injury or trauma. Then you might have a patient who's just had a seizure or might be seizing even at the time that which at which you have been called. Also, a patient in the ward can have a seizure, which will be shifted to the emergency or the ICU and you'll suddenly be called. This might be a post-operative patient or a patient who you were managing conservatively for some of the other problem. The third kind of patient will be someone with a sudden history of loss of consciousness. They're uh, just found unconscious or in front of uh, someone, they've gone into an altered sensorium or a lack of consciousness or a transient lack of consciousness. And this can this is a spontaneous event. And finally, you will have a patient with the classic history of what seems like a stroke, which is a history of slurring of speech, weakness of one side of the body. Uh, they'll come in late terms such as Muka Tedha Pan, which is, which is commonly used in, uh, in the north. And with speech disturbances, they'll suddenly become slow in their speech, slur in their speech, or they might stop speaking completely in global aphasia. And the common theme uh, among what uh, these patients that are brought to you in the neurosurgical emergency will be, what these patients, uh, what you do in the assessment, the treatment of these patients as a whole. So this includes a couple of concepts that I have broken down an assessment into. The first is the clinical assessment of the patient's neurological status itself. This includes the GCS, this includes the movements of the limbs, and this includes the pupils. And uh, very importantly, uh, the primary survey that we do in all patients of trauma and emergency now includes GCS and a very basic gross assessment of movement of the limbs. So this has now been been, been become part of the primary survey itself. In a secondary survey, you go ahead with a more detailed neurological examination. The second aspect is quickly recognizing the signs of raised intracranial pressure because that is one of your main aims. Whether it's a trauma patient, seizure patient, a patient with spontaneous loss of consciousness, these signs need to be picked up quickly and measures taken quickly. So a lot of these things happen simultaneously. You see a patient, quickly assess the GCS, quickly assess the pupils, quickly assess the limb movements, and then uh, within these, you find out with the vitals whether this patient is suffering from a raised intracranial pressure and start treatment immediately. The third is emergency treatment for trauma, seizures and stroke, which have to happen immediately even at the time of assessment from the vitals stage itself, which we will come to in the next few slides. And finally, understanding the imaging for decision making because a lot of things will decide on the imaging so you have to take you have to often follow the patient till the ct uh do see be able to read the ct while the ct is going on or the mri while the mri is going on quickly make a decision get the uh, operation theater ready or get the uh you know the technicians ready for whatever you need to do next and finally certain emergency surgical procedures that you need to know definitely as a neurosurgeon that will commonly be asked to you in your mcqs that often are done in the emergency room itself and you don't wait to for the patient to go to the ot now, coming to the clinical assessment, a 
let's we start with the scenarios that we mentioned in the in, in previously so a patient with history of trauma is brought unconscious to the emergency now this is the call that you will get yes the the casualty medical officer will call you say sir there's a case of a head injury it might be a child might be an old person might be a, a middle-aged lady and they're brought in unconscious with history of rta they'll have a lot of swelling and edema on the face they might have abrasions the, you might not even be able to check the pupils because there is so much periorbital edema and ecchymosis so the primary include uh, the assessment now that i've meant i've already mentioned includes the gcs and gross limb movement assessment now remember that gcs was originally made for trauma although now universally we use it for all conditions we use it even post-operatively to communicate with someone else uh, what the patient's neurological condition is however there are many pitfalls in gcs and this is what brings me to the most important point which is point number one we have done MCQs in this course where we have done an assessment of the GCS given as the patient's M response, V response, uh, eye opening response and the GCS has been asked or a representative question has been asked accordingly. Very, very clearly and very, very quickly I want to go ahead with making, explaining to you what GCS is and believe me, you might think you know it very well but until you do the assessment in a number of patients, there will be very, very strange circumstances that you will find. For example, Let's say your friend gets very drunk at a party and lands up in the hospital with a minor injury. This this friend of yours is very, very drunk. The friend is not listening to anyone, is becoming very aggressive. What is the patient's GCS? Now, again, I mentioned GCS is a coma score and therefore it should be used in coma. But, we gen but you, these kind of situations are often given in MCQs to confuse you. So the eye opening is very clear. It's the clearest and simplest thing to understand. So let's not discuss that. E1 is no eye opening. E2 is um, on pain or stimulation. E3 is on command. E4 is spontaneous. Now, the verbal response is very simple. Again, V1 is no response. V2 is in incoherent sounds. V3 is single words, no sentences. V4 is complete sentences, but not uh, responding to time, place and person, disoriented responses and V5 is a complete response. It's the M response that everyone asks and everyone gets confused in. So M1 is obviously no motor response. M2 is, ex uh, is extensor posturing. Remember, M2 and 3 are uh, posturing responses because of brainstem compression. They are very bad responses, which is why an M1 patient actually sometimes has more hope than an M2 and M3 patient because a patient can be M1 from a number of circumstances. The patient might not even have a head injury, might have a chest injury because of which or have aspirated because of which the patient is hypoxic and therefore the pH is very acidic and therefore the patient is not giving any response. And M1 can be because of poisoning, because of fumes. And M1 response can be because of diabetic ketoacidosis. An M1 response can be because the patient has been shifted uh, by a paramedical care center or from some other hospital with sedation. So sedation can cause an M1 response. But an M2 or M3 response is definitely because of a brainstem compression. So it definitely means there's a neurological structural component involved. M2 is abnormal extensor posturing. The hands are an extensor posturing. If you just remember this, you'll know that the hands are internally rotated. Uh, the wrists are, 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 you know, palma flexed and the legs are also extended. In a M3 response, the hands have abnormal flexure posturing. This is exactly it. No matter where you pinch this patient, ideally you're supposed to uh, give very specific responses which are above shoulder stimulation in GCS. That's because we want to stimulate in the cranial region or uh, trigeminal nerve region essentially because the spinal response, if you if you do a, a chest drop, a chest drop is definitely not recommended. Even if you worked in neurosurgery, everyone does a chest drop. The, if, you, if you tell the examiner, you know, that I'm going to do a chest drop, then this is actually the wrong way of doing things because of the Lazarus sign because it or spinal reflexes that might confuse your GCS assessment. So the idea ideal that is mentioned is actually a uh, is a supra uh, orbital uh, press pressure which is which uh, gives pressure on the supraorbital nerves uh, ear pinch is not very recommended but many people use an ear pinch uh, pressure on the shoulder above shoulder muscle uh, the uh, is sudden sharp pressure very deep pressure uh, on this muscle is going to definite a uh, trapezius sorry trapezius pinch is going to be the other important way of eliciting a gcs and uh, if the patient does an abnormal flexure posturing with the hands, then the legs are always extended. If the legs become flexed, it's automatically M4. It's not M3. 
in both m2 and m3 the legs are extended the knees are always extended and externally rotated and the the difference is in the how the hands uh, respond the upper limbs respond in m2 with an extensor posturing and the uh, in m3 with a flexure posturing if the patient is doing a normal flexion not an abnormal flexion he is moving his hands everywhere but not localizing to the sign to the point of uh, uh, the the stimulation it's an m4 response many uh, uh, people say that the withdrawal response is m4 response now think of it this way in a practical sense a patient is lying down where will the patient withdraw what will the patient withdraw you are pressing on the forehead the patient is not really going to withdraw from this response although some people have even given figures of uh, in this so in practical assessment if the patient is having a normal flexure response not an extensor type but is not able to localize it's an m4 response but many gcs scores talk talk about it as a withdrawal an M5 response is obviously localization, it's not difficult to say. And an M6 response is completely following commands. So this is the whole GCS, I've summarized it for you. I've given you a couple of the pitfalls and we've discussed this in our MCQs. Let's move on. Don't ignore the vitals. This is because the patient may die much sooner of shock than of raised ICP. A patient will might come in posturing because the patient has an EDH, but the patient might have a significant abdominal injury, blood collecting in the peritoneum. You see that the BP is uh, 60 over 40, and then you automatically realize that this patient is, is dying of hemorrhage even before the patient will die of an EDH. Many times an M1 response will be found in the patient because the patient has such a low BP that there is no cerebral perfusion pressure and the head is not injured. Remember that uh, hemorrhage can happen, significant hemorrhage can happen in the abdomen it can happen from long bone fractures such as femur fractures within the femur and the surrounding tissue itself. It can happen from hematuria and it can happen from even nasal epistaxis. Believe me, nasal epistaxis uh, in many patients is often swallowed and you don't even see the amount of blood that is actually coming out. It's actually being swallowed and going into the stomach. In children, a large subgalial hematoma can lead to shock, especially in very, very young children and toddlers. So don't ignore the vitals and uh, stabilize the spine before any movement. So for the spinal assessment before it, it is usually done, a detailed one is usually done in the secondary survey. But before anything, you need to stabilize the neck and preferably use a spine board or at least a Philadelphia collar. So this is basically the clinical assessment of a trauma patient. Let's move on to the next scenario. What about a seizure patient? You get a call saying that a patient has come in with seizures, with history of seizures or uh, is seizing at the time that uh, you get the call. Is the patient still seizing? That's the first question. If the patient is not seizing, the patient might be in altered sensorium for a significant amount of time. If the seizure has stopped spontaneously, place the patient on the uh, uh, monitor so you can continually monitor them. Sometimes these patients aspirate they need intubation while the to make sure that that uh, you know this aspiration doesn't take over the the patient's uh, metabolism now know the definition and treatment protocol for status epilepticus the most common question asked in both mcqs and vivas this happens because the patient is brought in with a seizure if it's a general tonic-clonic seizure you need to know step one step two step three three lines of treatment of what to do you first give the patient midazolam or uh, lorazepam is given sometimes midazolam is, is a short acting uh, very much preferred drug benzodiazepine that is given so that the patient's seizure can immediately stop at the same time you load the patient with with, uh, various first line medications. This includes levetiracetam, phenytoin, phosphenytoin. And the second line of treatment, if the seizure doesn't stop, is giving some other drug that is not used in the first line. So if you've given levetiracetam, give phosphenytoin. If you've given phenytoin, give phosphenytoin. If you've given phenytoin, give levetiracetam in the second line of therapy. The third line of therapy, if these two both don't work, if the patient continues to seize, is to sedate and ventilate the patient. What generally happens practically is you will load the patient with one, with one drug and give midazolam. If the patient doesn't stop seizing, you generally just sedate and ventilate the patient. But we don't actually follow two or three lines of treatment. In a good center, we directly just intubate the patient. That is to preserve the brain function. And that is because seizures often lead to hypoxia to the brain. And if a seizure lasts more than a few minutes, three minutes, four minutes, then the patient can have permanent hypoxia. So we have to make sure that the patient's brain is ventilated. Also, what to do if a seizure patient is brought to you or a patient seizes in front of you? This happens. It has happened in front of me in the OPD while the patient was sitting in front of me. It happens to every neurosurgeon. It's a very commonly asked question. You make the patient lie down 
and you make sure that the patient is in the lateral position or the prone position so that the patient's tongue fall doesn't cause obstruction to the airway. If a patient has had anything to eat or the patient vomits, that also it also helps them it to come out and not for the patient not to aspirate. You're never supposed to hold the limbs or the head of a seizing patient. The limb will fracture. You just place a pillow or your hand underneath the patient's head so the patient's uh, uh, does not the head does not hit the ground repeatedly. Pa seizures almost generally often stop within about 30 seconds. Um, if you are in a good setup, then placing a cannula to a patient who is seizing will be very tough. You can give them IM midazolam uh, as an initial therapy. Midasip sprays or midazolam sprays are also available that can be sprayed in the nose uh, to help seizure, stop a seizure. But still, most seizures will stop on their own. Just a good wait and watch policy with a monitor placed is not a bad thing to do. And uh, uh, also understand principles which are commonly asked uh, terms like Todd's palsy and Jacksonian march. Todd's palsy is something that happens after the seizure has gone away. The patient might have a hemiparesis, particularly if there is a structural lesion on the contralateral aspect. And Jacksonian march is something a patient will give us history or the attendants will give us a history uh, that a patient is brought in with a history that it initially started with one limb, then went down to the other limb, then the third limb, and then it became a general tonic-clonic seizure, which is why you need to know the definition of the, the status epilepticus and different types of seizures. The status epilepticus definitions are usually more than three seizures in 20 minutes or a seizure that lasts more than five minutes. And um, uh, the different types of seizures, what is grand mal epilepsy, petit mal epilepsy, these are the older names for epilepsy, whereas the newer names, the common names that are used, what is general tonic-clonic epilepsy uh, seizures, what is a tonic seizure, what is a clonic seizure, what is an absence seizure, uh, what is and special types of terms which are rare seizures that are commonly asked in MCQs, such as seizures, laughing seizures called gelastic seizures and automatisms, uh, which is like uh, a pugilistic automatism where a patient will stand in a boxer's mode, just like, you know, pugilistic Pugilistica, you've heard of in burns, um, because in burns, the attitude of a boxer is seen in uh, severe burns. Same thing, a patient might sta stand just before having a seizure or during a seizure in an automatism or a or a you know a boxer position. These have been given names uh, by the old neurologists, and people love asking MCQs on this. Um, so the and finally about seizures, I'd like to say you should know the different stages of a seizure. What is pre aura? What is aura? What is the main seizure? And what is the post seizure phase? So I have discussed seizure very quickly with uh, the basis of a patient brought in uh, with a seizure into the emergency. Like I said, it is the hub in which many spokes go, and it it is really MCQ heavy because of all of these concepts. Next, a patient brought in with a sudden spontaneous loss of consciousness. Think brain hemorrhage. You can also think stroke, severe stroke, vertebral artery stroke, but for a neurosurgical aspect, think brain hemorrhage. So understand the different types of brain hemorrhage. They're, the most common is a basal ganglia bleed, a thalamic bleed being most common or a putaminal bleed being most common. Then there can also be ventricular hemorrhages, there can be subarachnoid hemorrhages, and there can be even subdural hemorrhages sometimes with dural AV, AV fistulas. And you need to know certain uh, clinical signs that point to these diagnoses because these are commonly asked even before the CT. If the patient has hyperpyrexia, if the patient has pinpoint pupils, it is most commonly a pontine bleed. It is a sign of a pontine hemorrhage. BG bleeds, usually uh, lead to a stroke-like feature. They'll have exactly what is happens in a stroke. That's why it's called a hemorrhagic stroke. And the patient will have weakness on one side, slurred speech, um, and, uh, you know, um, and uh, the facial palsy. And uh, you need to know something like an SAH. An SAH in spontaneous bleed, the patient will come in with a severe headache. Sometimes there'll be an altered sensorium. So the attendants will give you the history the, of a thunderclap headache. They'll say it's the worst headache of my life. They have the headache maybe after an hour or two hours. They sometimes go into altered sensorium or unconscious when they are brought. So many times the patients are brought in conscious state will give you this exact same history. It's the worst headache of my life. So these are the few clinical signs that it is an SAH or a BG bleed or a brainstem bleed and you have to know the clinical aspects even before the imaging is done. What about a patient who comes with stroke-like features, weakness and speech difficulties? You have to know the assessment of a stroke. Now, there are many scores for stroke. Generally, it's asked to neurologists. There's a large NIHS stroke uh, uh, stroke score, which is quickly done by neurologists to know if the patient needs to be thrombolized or not. That is the basic principle. As a neurosurgeon, you won't be asked so much of that. What you'll be asked is uh, various stroke syndromes, which might happen in a posterior fossa stroke. Posterior fossa strokes are usually because of vertebral artery blockages or basilar artery, but usually vertebral artery. Artery. And if the pica basically is blocked, which leads to supply of the lateral medulla 
recently had a lateral medullary syndrome patient and these patients uh, are it's important to recognize them because once the edema spreads it can actually lead to hydrocephalus which needs surgery or po even posterior fossa decompression if there's a uh, concomitant cerebellar stroke with a mass effect. So, you need to know this various stroke syndromes. That's a whole other topic. I think I've taken an entire lecture just on stroke syndromes uh, in the brainstem. Wallenberg syndrome, lateral medullary syndrome, uh, medial medullary syndrome, Pontine stroke syndrome, uh, many other stroke syndromes that we have covered, Benedict's, Weber's syndrome. And uh, you need to know all of these, including the cross-section of the brain uh, to answer your MCQs. Now, Thrombolizing a stroke medical or it can happen in two phases. This is just to inform you. We use alteplase or recombinant ateloplase for medical intervention in uh, stroke. And now we have intravascular interventions in stroke done by both uh, neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, and many times neurologists who have taken this, taken up this field in which we use suction devices and baskets to actually mechanically break down the clot and suction it out. Now, before we do this, we have to also rely on certain imaging. Now, there are two ways to go about this. A CT is done very rapidly before an MRI. Remember, sometimes an MRI can take up to half an hour. So, a patient doesn't often have half an hour. So, on the basis of CT, uh, there has been something called an aspects score, which is a summary of the various territories that are obviously visible on a CT. And those are then used to directly thrombolize the patient, especially in mechanical interventional thrombectomy. But the most common investigation used to be diffusion weighted imaging imaging. Many times it is not recognizable on early CT, but it is recognizable on DWI. Now we have many other uh, special uh, stroke imaging sequences and uh, SWI is very good for blood, but uh, DWI still remains the basic standard and the basic cast MCQ. What is the imaging uh, of choice for a patient of stroke to recognize two things, the area of the stroke and the ischemic penumbra, which can be saved if the patient gets a thrombolysis. So, that's uh, mainly about stroke and, uh, you know, uh, hemorrhagic stroke that you will be involved with. The next important concept you have to understand is understanding ICP. Now, ICP can be raised in all of these conditions. So, what you need to do as soon as you recognize the raised ICP, patient comes to you, you assess the patient's uh, GCS, you found the patient has an anisocoria, you found the patient has a bradycardia, hypertension, and the patient has a poor GCS. The patient is an M3, let's say, posture. You know M3 or M2 is definitely because of a mass effect and raised intracranial pressure. What do you do immediately? You raise the patient's bed by about 30 to 45 degrees. Now, there are different books that say different types. MCQs generally agree on 30 degrees as the raise uh, up to 40 and some will give you 45 degrees as a choice. Most will not confuse you, but definitely not more than 45 degrees because this hurts the ventilation perfusion ratio of the brain. So, uh, raising the bed will actually ha actually helps in reducing the ICP. You will see this as a neurosurgeon. So, many times when we operate, the brain is start, starts to swell because of, uh, uh, you know, various factors. Let's say you are uh, removing a tumor and uh, because of traction injury, there is a venous bleed which is present within the brain parenchyma. You actually see the brain swell in front of you and raising the head actually makes it go down. So, you, we actually have a picture of how all of this actually uh, helps the patient. Secondly, hyperventilation. Patients at M5 and below normally need to be intubated. That is the basic criteria. An M5 patient needs to be intubated who you know will remain in M5 if the patient is not operated. There are some conditions in which the patient is M5, which is misrecognized, such as a dysphasic patient, a patient with uh, a bleed or a stroke of the left side, patient will not follow commands. So, the patient cannot become M6. But this kind of patient you know is M5 because of a dysphagic response. Again, I've told you that this is one of the pitfalls of GCS. But there are patients, let's say a patient of SDH or EDH, you know that this patient will not become better than M5 till he's operated or she's operated. So, you have to intubate this patient. Even though the patient is able to breathe, you have to protect the patient's airway from aspiration. And that's why M5 patients need to be intubated. Now, M4 and below definitely need to be intubated. And once they're intubated, you need to hyperventilate this patient. The normal uh, value accepted is 25 to 35 millimeters of mercury of PaCO2. So, you keep the PaCO2 on the lower side, but you don't keep it very low because you don't want to destroy the, um, the uh, hypercapneic, you know, a stimulation for the respiratory center which is extremely essential. Normally, a value of 30 to 35 millimeters of PA, uh, mercury for PaCO2 is followed for hyperventilation. The third thing that you do as a conservative measure is sedation. You sedate the patient. Sedation definitely helps in reducing ICP. And 
we have then we give medications for the reduction of icp which are our favorite medication is mannitol but there are other medications available three percent normal saline is has been given much better points in many conditions particularly in children for the reduction of icp than mannitol uh, so mannitol uh three percent ns earlier they used to use glycerol uh, even iv so um, oral glycerol is still used by many older surgeons today uh, in patients who are awake and conscious uh, but uh, at one point of time uh, it's still available in the market a mannitol glycerol combination iv was also used so before we continue we have to understand the two principles of two main principles of icp which are discussed in your textbooks and in your mcqs the first is uh, why ICP? Why do we measure intracranial pressure? We are not actually after intracranial pressure. We are after cerebral blood flow. As the intracranial pressure rises, the cerebral blood flow is uh, reduces because of the Monroe Kelly doctrine. We have already discussed the Monroe Kelly doctrine. It is the most commonly discussed thing. It is a very old doctrine. And essentially, it, may, it states that the cranium is a closed cavity in terms of volume. And therefore, the volume of one thing increases, the other thing has to reduce. So, if there is a brain hemorrhage or a tumor occupying the space, the volume of blood and CSF has to reduce and if that doesn't reduce, it pushes the brain matter out and after and beyond a point of time, the patient is going to die. So that's the Monroe Kelly doctrine. So as the uh, as the space occupying lesion increases in the brain, the intracranial pressure increases that leads to a reduction of the from the mean arterial pressure, which has to pump much harder to send blood inside this already pressured cavity and therefore reduces uh, leads to reduction in cerebral blood flow. Now, cerebral blood flow direct measurement is very tough. Many uh, different uh, ways have been tried such as invasive ways uh, and uh, you know invasive catheters and even infrared catheters to directly measure cerebral blood flow, but they are not commonly available. They are not very, very dependable and in a usual setting, they can't be done very commonly. And uh, so, what we depend on is the, uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure, but even that is directly not uh, measurable. What is measurable in this equation is the mean arterial pressure, which you will definitely get even on the monitor and the ICP. So, the ICP is measured with different and uh, different ways. You have direct clinical assessment that the ICP is raised and these are clear operative criteria. So, the actual measurement of ICP, really it takes effect if the patient is well M6 or in, um, uh, you know, in a phase where the patient might be managed medically, may not require surgery, but you need to monitor the patient. ICP measurement is often done by placing ICP catheters often in the emergency itself, where the most commonly used is an intraventricular catheter where you drain out the ventricular fluid to reduce the pressure as well as measure it. Uh, very commonly, I use a Codman's uh, intraparenchymal uh, pressure monitor, which is an electric pressure transducer. It can be placed uh, subdurally, it can be placed extradurally and, uh, you know, uh, ICP uh, is therefore measured to get a basic understanding that, you know, beyond, below this limit, usually what limit we follow is 20 uh, millimeters of, uh, 20 centimeters of water. And if this, below, it remains below this limit, we are not going to operate. We can continue giving um, conservative measurement above 20 or, or repeated excursions over 20, we generally operate. Many people operate at even 18. So, uh, moving on. Uh, you have to, so this is one very important concept of the waves of ICP. Now, no one actually in practical terms sees or measures the ICP waves. There are three waves or they're called Lundberg's waves. And uh, theoretically, they're a very important concept. They used to be uh, asked before, but no one actually, not even the monitors give the Lundberg's waves anymore. Uh, it is they're divided, divided into A, B and C. A wave is the most uh, important and an excursion of the A wave generally, uh, generally re reflects a raised ICP. So, the next step for you to do is quickly understand the radiology. Remember, neurosurgery is a field where we do not depend on the radiologists for most of our work because we need to have a 3D visualization even uh, from a 2D film of what we are going to find inside and it's going to take you a while uh, in your residency to be able to get that visualization. In fact, you, I have worked on that visualization a lot and I still work on that visualization. I try to see 2D images and try to already imagine that my entry point from the brain is going to be so and so. This is what I'm going to find. This is the structure of the tumor. This is where I'm going to find that tumor. So when it comes, the first and foremost aspect is to um, uh, is to understand emergency scans and in this extradural hemorrhages, uh, we've talked about biconvex lesions in the uh, in the brain in the CT SDHs the you know moon shaped lesions IVH intraventricular hemorrhage including the fissure grade of hemorrhage SAH including fissure grade of hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage and contusions which can increase uh, with time. 
and can become much bigger or three times their size as the patient's condition progresses. We have to be able to recognize basal ganglia bleeds and intracerebral hemorrhages, particularly uh, posterior fossa hemorrhages, brainstem hemorrhages, uh, cerebellar hemorrhages and uh, understand operative criteria based on these. Now, among these, there are many things that we discussed in our lecture series, including the volume measurement of the various eyes, uh, of the various bleeds and the operative criteria for the same, particularly in an M6 patient. Um, now, also you have to know, understand that if the clinical picture does not match the scan, the scan appears normal, but the clinical picture is that of a severe head injury, the patient's GCS is showing that, then it can possibly be a diffuse axonal injury, which again has three grades and you have to be able to grade it based on your CT. Then, then we have to come to the operative criteria for depressed fractures and depressed fractures are often operated for cosmetic reasons, but sometimes also, but uh, sometimes also because they have an underlying contusion or because they can be a cause for underlying seizures in the future, or, uh, yeah, you know, uh, it can also be a precursor for a dirty wound or a CSF leak, particularly if it's a compound depressed fracture. So, you have to understand what depressed fractures are and the criteria and the relative contraindications, which are equally important. A cosmetic depressed fracture, closed depressed fracture, small one on the sagittal sinus, maybe you don't want to operate that. Or on the transverse sinus, maybe shouldn't be operated. Or over the uh, motor homunculus with no deficit at the time of taking in for surgery, maybe you'd want to stay away from those fractures. It's all relative contraindications, but they must be understood and they're commonly asked in your MCQs. Now, also what for the other conditions, for the seizures, um, for stroke, you'll be able to see a stroke definitely, an MCA stroke, if you know the territories, MCA stroke, ACA stroke, uh, posterior cerebral, uh, uh, posterior fossa strokes, which are, is it a pica stroke, is it a, a vertebral artery stroke, you have to be able to see these on the CT itself and, and also uh, you have to be able to understand the angio for these, particularly when it comes to subarachnoid hemorrhages and possibly aneurysms or EVMs as the cause, you have to be able to tell what kind of, of aneurysm it is, uh, whether it's saccular, fusiform, narrow-necked, long-necked, what is its direction, anteriorly placed, posteriorly placed, which territory, MCA, MCA bifurcation. That leads us to the understanding of the anatomy of the vessels. What is an M1 segment? Where does it end? M2, M3, A1, A2, A3, uh, the, the PCOM and uh, PCOM aneurysms. And so that goes completely into understanding vascular neurosurgery, but it starts with the emergency room. And uh, you need to understand whether space occupying lesions, particularly on CT, which don't take up contrast, what you'll see is just a mass effect. You'll see edema, there'll be a midline shift, but often there won't be any lesion. That occurs in subacute subdural hemorrhages as well, and it occurs in many mass lesions, metastasis being one of the most commonly encountered. Metastasis are lesions with very small, tiny foci with a very gross edema around it. And if you see a lesion like this, particularly in an older patient, particularly in a patient with history of hemoptysis or, you know, uh, bloody diarrhea, you know, this could be a uh, metastasis. So, you need to give dexamethasone immediately because it leads to wonderful results in decreasing the ICP, even as opposed to mannitol and the other forms. So, you have to understand edema and you have to understand the brain herniation syndromes. Is it subfalcine herniation? Is it uncle herniation? Is it transtentorial herniation? Because these have different ways in which they express themselves. This will show as an anisocoria very early on. This will show maybe as an anisocoria, but more commonly as a loss of GCS. This will not show at all. Many times the patient will only complain of a pain in the back of the head because of the uh, tonsillar herniation that is happening and compressing the uh, nerve supply from which is common to both the back of the subocciput and the dura and the patient can often suddenly deteriorate from that point. In fact, arrest after that point being a transtentorial herniation. So, uh, you have to understand that once you see a herniation on a scan and you have to correlate it with clinically with the patient and how the patient is going to behave uh, from that uh, herniation and how much time do you actually have and if any further investigation is required. If you need to know whether this patient requires an MRI to further, further uh, see or characterize the lesion, an angio or a DSA to further characterize the lesion before you br uh, bring in an operative strategy. Now, among finally, among operative management, I'd like to talk about, now there's various operative management uh, for various conditions. Aneurysms, completely different thing, tumors, completely different thing, trauma, completely different. But there are some things you often need to do in the emergency itself. I've already mentioned the placement of an ICP catheter. Uh, you also have to do sometimes a twistal craniotomy or even a burr hole craniotomy in the emergency itself for a chronic subdural hemorrhage, which has a very good prognosis if evacuated on time. Patients can come in a M2, M3 status even with a chronic SDH and can improve to M6. And 
the more importantly, you need to be able to place an external ventricular drain into the catheter. Now, you should be able to do this both from a frontal aspect and from a parietal aspect, the Keynes point. And uh, this is one of the most uh, commonly used and one of the first few things that are taught to every resident in neurosurgery. So, you have to be able to decompress the ventricles to rapidly reduce ICP. You also need to know when not to decompress the ventricles and when the ventricle is going to be difficult to hit. So, these are the few procedures you need to know that are done often in the emergency setting itself. Now, practical point, not asked in MCQs, but you need to know how to place a central venous catheter. You need to know how to do an intubation, you need to do how to do a tracheostomy, and also preferably a cricothyroidotomy if you don't have any time, but most of us, we can do tracheostomies very, very rapidly. So, you, these are extremely important to become a complete neurosurgeon and a confident neurosurgeon. Um, rest of operative management obviously depends on the lesion that is being dealt with. So, Thanks for listening. I have what I've done basically what my aim was to do was to introduce you to a topic uh, that will lead you to understanding where neurosurgery emergency neurosurgery begins and go from there because um, most again most commonly discussed most commonly discussed in vivas most commonly discussed in your textbooks and most commonly asked in your MCQs and that's why and also very important for you to learn. It's very interesting um, and something you need to be prepared with something that will make you or introduce you to becoming an actual neurosurgeon is when you're called into the emergency. There will be casualty medical officers around. There might be even senior general surgeons around and they won't know what to do and you have to be there understanding the situation being confident and uh, you know making sure the patient gets the right treatment. Believe me it is one of the greatest gifts to becoming a neurosurgeon. Hi. So, uh, I hope you really uh, enjoyed the live session. I hope uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, informative to you. I have uh, just five minutes ago, I've come back and made myself a little comfortable so I can answer your questions. Um, I would, while I give you a little bit of a conclusive advice, particularly because the INI CET uh, has come up, which is going to be earlier than the NEET, which is in uh, the INI CET will be in December. I'd like to give you two little pieces of advice uh, while you can think of questions you'd like to ask and uh, put them up so I can answer them uh, while seeing it in the chat window. So the first thing um, I'd like to say is that the INI CET are those institutions that consider themselves the prime. So I have given interviews. Uh, I obviously, I, I did my MCH from PJ Chandigarh, so I gave that interview. I've given the interview for Chitra. I've given the interview for Ames. Now, these institutes have a very specific pattern of how they choose people. That's why that's how they also choose their questions. What they want is someone they can mold. They have this they have this thing that they want people who they don't need people with experience in neurosurgery or tremendous neurosurgeons or who have worked in neurosurgery before, but it helps to have worked in neurosurgery before. But what you need to know is that you need to be very good with how you receive a patient, how you're going the methodology in which you're going to see that patient and uh, what you're going to do as an immediate action. They want you to be able to be prepared at two in the morning, four in the morning, and not screw things up. So by the time a senior, a senior comes or a senior consultant comes, uh, you should be able to have worked in the right direction, or at least theoretically know the concepts in which those directions are there. That is why I've chosen this topic, because both it is the starting point for a lot of MCQs, so they place a lot of MCQs on it. Now about AIMS, so there is a book called, uh, there is a set of questions called the uh, USMLE Boards for uh, Neurosurgery. So it's called the Board Review, the US Board Review. And they have a lot of questions on critical care in neurosurgical patients. And Ames loves that book. They Their previous papers are filled with questions, sometimes even directly with the same values from the book. So here's a little bit of extra pointing for you. Read NAC board review. Uh, it's available on multiple groups. And, you know, you can get it on Telegram. You can get it online actually. And uh, the same book has been repeating for years on end. And what you'll find different in that book as opposed to other MCQ books is they'll give you stuff like ABG values in a patient. What do you do next with this ABG? This patient is in acidosis. This patient just had a coiling. So he had a. Uh, there's a lot of uh, dye that has gone. Suddenly the patient is in acidosis. So you need to basically flush out the kidneys. And those kind of concepts, they will have uh, spine concepts that you won't generally get in Indian MCQ books, such as uh, the angle of spence, uh, when to operate a lateral canal recess, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, what nerve will be involved if there is a, uh, uh, a intervertebral disc herniation with a lateral recess stenosis. So it will be the same level as opposed to the lower level if you know, understand the concept previously. Uh, so these kind of questions. As far as PGI is concerned, uh, so basically you have a lot of this general surgery portion and you, have, you need to nail that. For nailing the general surgery portion, I'm sure the Dr. Rohan and the other team on, in the general surgery team will really help you. The neurosurgery portion, now sometimes they make the exam very easy. That's not good for people actually who are preparing for neurosurgery and have been preparing for a while. For people who have been preparing for a while, having a tough neurosurgery paper and an easy general surgery paper is actually a very, very good thing. So in the year I got through, for example, the neurosurgery paper was very hard. And when I say hard, number one, it's the pattern. Now they changed the pattern common. They made it common for all these exams. But the pattern of PGI was difficult. Plus, the extent of knowledge that PGI required was very high. For example, they would ask everything from the W, every detail of the WHO classification of tumors, as opposed to just the superficial stuff. They would ask about uh, the four types of uh, genetic classification for medulloblastoma. Uh, they would ask about uh, the receptor patterns for vasospasm, including some of the receptor molecules which are postulated to have caused a problem, such as endothelins and interferon gamma. So what happens is that uh, they go more into the detail. Now, the question is, who is going to make the INI CET paper? And most likely, it's going to be people from AIMS because that's what is, or they'll give it to NAT board and NAT board. Uh, the the uh, National uh, Board of Examinations for Medical Specialties, that's next to AIMS. The, the office is actually right next to AIMS. So they actually have a lot of uh, communication with faculty from AIMS. So they'll pick up one faculty from AIMS who will give it to some junior to make it. This is how it works. I've seen it happening. I've helped out with some of the question paper making in the past. So uh, you need to know uh, the AIMS pattern. And the AIMS pattern is essentially... Uh, they love asking these basic sciences questions, how to manage ICP, how to manage patients in the emergency. They love asking critical care questions about metabolic uh, problems and even, for example, even how the brain would react to diabetic ketoacidosis and those kind of questions. They love asking some detailed concepts of spine as opposed to what you will uh, expect. And they love classifications. I think uh, neurocutaneous markers is a favorite topic for everyone and AIMS goes crazy on neurocutaneous markers. Now, I don't know if the interview is going to be in, in effect this year. I, up till now, we don't have any information for interviews. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, but I have uh, told you that in an interview, if you if you get to an interview stage, whether it's now or whether it's later, because the next NEAT exam is going to be very early because this one was postponed. Uh, so if, if interviews come into play, then you need to be able to understand the same exact concept. When the question exactly they will ask is, you are a resident in the emergency, a patient of trauma is brought in, or a patient with seizure is brought in, or a patient with spontaneous uh, loss of consciousness is brought in. What do you do? And you need to basically not try to show, if you have a lot of knowledge, don't try to show off that you're already a neurosurgeon. They don't like that. I mean, they're very egotistical. What you need to do is you need to show that, listen, this is the amount of knowledge I have. This I don't know, but I am willing to learn. And that is the basic principle behind cracking any interview, even your final MCH viva. Because even your final MCH viva, the examiner will try to prove that in the three years you've worked, you know shit, you don't know anything. So what, uh, what you have to say is, listen, I have gone up till this point. I have made my effort. This I don't know. I'm not going to bullshit you. But I deserve to be a neurosurgeon. And I will not lead to any gross mistake. You can't say grossly wrong answers. For example, even your MCQs. You can't come in not knowing basic ICP values. What is the highest value of ICP? And even that is a controversial topic. I mean, surprisingly, there is no exact limit in which we say, okay, now it's in raised ICP, now it's not. There is definitely a range. But you have to be knowledgeable about all the ranges. For acoustic schwannoma, you have to be knowledgeable about how facial nerve palsy occurs in the house in Brackman grade for facial nerve palsy because it is the basic that is required. And if you reach that basic level, you will start placing. And that is the aim. Make sure that the basics are done. You have to know the, the, the a list of tables, classifications, and principles. Start ranking and then leave it to luck. Because in the end, the paper might you might be very lucky about that paper or you might be very unlucky about that paper. But you can't be unlucky below a certain limit. After that, you've just not prepared. 
So I'll give you uh, one last piece of live advice uh, before you can ask any questions if you'd like to. There are two things. One, neurosurgery as a career, because let's be honest, most people even in general surgery don't know. Many people don't have postings in neurosurgery. And many people who have been posted in neurosurgery also don't get to do a lot of work in neurosurgery because it's a very, it's a very cryptic branch. Um, and second thing I'll give you is my personal journey during my entrance exams, which is a very different time than it is now. So first thing, your career as a neurosurgeon. So neuro, there are three things. I'm, I'm going to be talking very practically. You are not kids anymore. You're not in first year MBBS with dreams. You need to think about the future as an individual or an, as a family member and as a researcher and a person who needs to earn money. So there are three aspects to any uh, medical profession. One, how much is going to pay you? Two, what is the research potential if you are interested in research? There's a good chance you might not be interested in research. That's perfectly fine. But if you are, does it provide a good research potential? And three, what is your personal work-life balance going to be? Are you at the end of your residency going to get divorced or not? Believe me, that's a very, very practical question because of the amount of uh, time and commitment it takes uh, to get through neurosurgery. So one, are you going to make money? Yes, you are going to make money in neurosurgery. And I'll tell you why. See, uh, before 2000, the results in neurosurgery were not very great. All right. So basically, what happened was that uh, we didn't have good operative microscopy and good localization. I mean, the first MRI in Delhi came in 1992, approximately, in a tiny institute called Institute of Human Behavior and Allied Sciences, IBAS. And the whole of Delhi used to send patients to that to get that shitty 0.5 Tesla MRI and it used to be three months waiting. Patients used to die during the wait. Patients still die waiting for surgery, but they don't die for MRIs at least. So we have one, one thing, we have great localization now. And two, we have great operative microscopy, which has come into even smaller institutes now. So our results have increased significantly. They've gotten much better. And two, so the prognosis has gotten better and therefore the acceptance of neurosurgery has gotten better. Hence, patient load has gotten better and availability has gotten better. But even more importantly, why you're going to make money as a young surgeon? No one will touch the brain but you. Now, if you are posted in a center which receives trauma or emergencies, you are patient, the patient is going to get operated by you. Despite what you believe is a urologist, uh, a urologist might make in terms of money or, uh, you know, a plastic surgeon might make in terms of money. The practical uh, part of, pra of actual practice is that if the patient gets time to think about whom to get operated by, they are going to choose someone older, someone more affordable. There are many criteria. But if the patient doesn't have time, even if Prime Minister Modi is traveling right next to my hospital, has an accident and has an EDH, he has to get operated by me. It, in half an hour, he will deteriorate and die and he doesn't have a choice. And that is why young neurosurgeons can make a significant amount of money early on in their career for the next 10 years. After 10 to 15 years, it is my prediction that the number of seats will start saturating even smaller areas. The pay scales in periphery are tremendously good for neurosurgery, extremely good for neurosurgery. And slowly but surely, operative results are getting better, confidence is getting better. So in the future, for the next 10, maybe 20 years, neurosurgery will be a very, very good field to be in, to make money, to make money early and, uh, you know, to succeed as a young surgeon. Number two, the research potential. I have a lot of publications. I love uh, research. The brain is the next frontier. There is no doubt about it. We're done with the heart. We're done with the kidneys. Plastic surgery, maybe, you know, we're doing a lot of work in, uh, in reconstruction. But we do still know so little about the brain that you can publish from the neurological aspect. You can publish from the neurosurgical aspect. You can publish from the neuroepidemiological aspect. And you can publish definitely from new things like neural links, brain machine interfaces even uh, bionic arms i have a, i have i do a lot of work in brachial plexus and i have a deep interest in bionic arms even making the equivalent of a jaipur foot for the arm for brachial plexus will make you a tremendous champion for the cause in india so it has an extremely good uh, research potential coming to point number 3 so there's money in it there's research in it but what isn't in it is work life balance um, so it is an emergency field and that thrills me. I am a, I love emergencies, but it's not for everyone in the beginning, particularly in the first four to five years of your life, you will struggle in terms of work-life balance because you will have to go at nights. 
you've operated a meningioma in the morning that patient will deteriorate at 2 in the morning uh, 2 am the next day you have to be there it doesn't matter if your friend if in your best friend's wedding it doesn't matter if in your your wedding if you've not placed someone on duty and you are the person on call and an edh comes you have to have to go and operate it so the work life balance suffers uh, as opposed to other branches for the first maybe 4 5 maybe 6 years beyond which what happens is you either get a junior who can handle the emergencies for you at least you know do the same job you were doing or you you graduate into a different kind of uh, field you might be doing only spine you might be doing only vascular or you might be doing only uh, tumors no one actually does that you do everything but you start getting very comfortable in the mechanisms in which the patients are handled so that it's the the flight or fight response isn't so much but for the first five years ten years and in fact, for your whole life, there is definitely going to be a point that you have to pick up phone calls at four in the morning. Uh, I've worked with Padmashri, Dr. V.S. Mehta, and uh, he's 73. And he will, if you, if I call him at three in the morning at any point of time, any day, even though I'm not working with him anymore, he will pick up his phone in three rings. And that is basically the kind of life you will have to live. You, you can't not live it. That's part of an emergency care department and a department with severe uh sometimes severe mobilities and sudden uh, occurrences so that being said the for the final thing in my talk i'd like to tell you about my journey in my entrance exams because that is really going to help you being a very knowledgeable neurosurgeon or a knowledgeable doctor in general does not mean you will crack exams being able to crack exams means you will be able to crack exams don't think of your exam as a test for your knowledge. I, I know it might sound contradictory, but it's very true. Think of your exam as a 100 meter race. So you might be a really great athlete. You might be able to run a marathon. But 100 meter racers are 100 meter racers. They are focused on being able to build that kind of you know, body to, to beat others in a 100 meter dash. So you need to be the kind of person with the focus to beat a MCQ examination. It doesn't matter if you know, don't know large swaths of very essential neurosurgery as long as you know what is the answer to the question that is being asked on that day. So to do that, so how do you, how do you get yourself in that? First, get out of the mode of I am going to read everything and every big book. There are a certain number of people, I'm sure, one, there are many of you. I used to be like that. I'd pick up the biggest book available and I think that within two months, I'm going to be a master of neurosurgery. I get done with mainly only two chapters and... Uh, I leave out the rest, which is more essential. So you have your books. You have Greenberg. You have uh, Ram Murthy and Tandon's little, vo little volume. And you have your MCQ books. My aim, my suggestion is, if you're part of Marrow, go through my lectures. It's a, it's a complete uh, baseline into what you will need. So you can get very acquainted with the overall nature of neurosurgery. Go to Greenberg. Read the individual topics. Just give it a reading. Just give it a reading. Don't worry about the of forgetting information. Just give it a reading and know what all is there. Then go to your MCQs. And then go back from MCQ to book. MCQ to book. If you open your MCQs right from the start in neurosurgery, you won't understand shit. Believe me, it will sound alien to you. I mean, who in general surgery ever reads about hydrocephalus? How much did you read about it in MBBS? You don't know. You don't know about neurological localization. You don't know about aneurysms. You don't know about the, uh, the types of tumors. But if you get through a baseline education, then go to the MCQs, you have an idea of what they're talking about and you can fill in the knowledge gaps, retrograde, going back to the textbook from your MCQ, back to the textbook from your MCQ, do as many MCQs as possible. And finally, see this, how they make papers. I'll tell you how papers are made. You'd think they'll put in a lot of brain into it, but it really depends on who gets the responsibility to make your examination paper. Now, if this is a lazy person, all they're going to do is take up the previous questions from the previous years, which you will not have a copy of because they don't share these in many of the exams. So they'll go to the previous year's questions, they'll pick up some questions and they'll put them on the uh, uh, on the paper. The other chance is they will pick up the same books you're reading and they will not make new MCQs. That takes effort. They'll take the same MCQ books and they will put them on the paper. There cannot be an MCQ that has been published that an assistant professor or an associate or a, or a professor in a central institute who makes the paper can get their hands on that you do not answer. And believe me, I've seen people rank without knowing any neurosurgery, just fresh out of their uh, uh, GS and just reading MCQs and still getting a decent rank because luck has favored them. So 
that's point number three. Get a basic idea of neurosurgery. Go to your MCQs, study retrograde from your MCQs and make sure one of the most important thing, there should not be a published MCQ in the market that you do not know the answer of. You do this, I assure you, you will rank. You might not get the institute you want. Don't be very, very choosy about your institutes. Just start off with your career. Don't think that today, oh, I've got an SDPGI. I wanted to get to AIMS or PGI. But uh, I have gotten, uh, you know, Calcutta Medical College. I've gotten Scion. I've gotten KEM. And now I don't want to go there. Don't be like that. If you get a neuros if you want to do neurosurgery, you get a neurosurgery seat. Every institute has its pros and cons. Just get your qualification and get into the market. Because the sooner you start in the market, the sooner you start your career, the, the better it is. Finally, my journey was, uh, in my time, there was six monthly exams. There was no NEET. There was this, just the year just before NEET, actually. So I gave, I must have given in every session some fifth, some 10 exams because each exam was individual. It was actually very harrowing. You had to go from one institute to another institute to another institute and give the exams. Give SDPJ in Lucknow, AIMS in Delhi, PJ in Chandigarh, uh, Chitra, go to Trivandrum, uh, go to all these places physically, give the exam. And then each of them had their own pattern. So we used to study a lot of different patterns. SDPJ gave MBBS level questions. They gave biochemistry and uh, detailed biochemistry like glycogen cycle. I was so disappointed. We read so much neurosurgery and this is what they're asking. So uh, basically what happens was that uh, you, I gave all these exams. In my first attempt, uh, I ranked uh, ran, uh, waitlist one in AIMS. By the way, I had ranked waitlist one for Nimhans neurosurgery for the six years course in my PG. But I saw my seat going ahead away from me. Same thing happened in my first attempt in AIMS. Uh, I got waitlisted one, but I wasn't part of the interview. So, uh, you know, in the counseling, basically, there was no point. Uh, waitlist one is as good as you didn't get it because generally people don't leave AIMS. Generally, they don't. Now, in my second attempt, I thought I would crack it. Obviously, in my first attempt, I have waitlist one names. You know, next time I'm definitely going to crack AIMS. There was no seat in gen general category of AIMS in my second attempt. No seat. Only the one that one that uh, seat that was there that was SC only. So there was no exam essentially for me. I could give the exam for practice, but there was no seat. I went through all the exams. Panth, RML Hospital, where I done my MS from, uh, didn't make it. Panth, I didn't make it. Chitra, I didn't make it. Chitra was in December only, sorry. Jipmar, I didn't make it. So many exams I didn't make. Finally, I sat for the PJ exam thinking that, okay, maybe I should sit down and start thinking about the next session six months from now. Uh, quite disappointed. But that day, the depth of knowledge I had in neurosurgery and the fact that the general surgery paper was easier than most papers uh, really helped me. I scored well in general surgery and I scored really well in neurosurgery and I aced the interview. So I was ranked two in PJ after the interview. So that's what I'm saying. It's don't be disappointed if you don't make it. If you like the profession, start working in neurosurgery because, you know, it's it's not going to be knowledge wasted. What I learned in the one year while I prepared for uh, these entrance exams, I was in Loknaik Hospital, which is part of Maulana Azad Medical College. Um, I did maybe 13 shunts, innumerable head trauma and uh, with instruments that were so shitty, you have no idea. And I started understanding what neurosurgery really is. And in the first two depressing weeks when I thought no one gets better, I once I did a chronic SDH and I saved a life from M2 to M6. The patient next day folded his hand, said thank you and went home. And then I thought to myself, this shit actually works. So that knowledge has really helped me. And uh, believe me, think about it. Try neurosurgery. It's a wonderful field. I love it. You have to love it to really appreciate it. I love the brain. I love going into the brain. I don't think any other organ is so interesting. It's that uh, it's that devious. You know, the brain is a very devious character. You will think everything has been done well, and then one small cautery will hit one vein at uh, the vein of Labe or the vein of Trollard, and uh, the patient will have a deficit. So you can't be sure till the final suture whether everything has gone well. And when it goes well, it's the price is tremendous. When it goes badly, the low is also very tremendous. But if you live for that kind of thrill, and uh, then definitely, you know, neurosurgery is for you. I've also already mentioned about the money and the personal life aspect. So yeah, uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd love to hear them. I'm going to wait for about uh, a little bit. Um, I'd love to hear from you uh, if, uh, and at least, you know, feedback. Did you think this was good? Did you enjoy? Uh, what we said, should, do you have any suggestions on what topic I should take later on, maybe in the future? Uh, anything would be welcome.
Okay, so uh, Dr. Abhishek has asked for important topics for NEET super specialty. So um, if you go through the list of uh, topics according to which I've made my lectures in uh, MARO, those are basically important topics. But uh, if I had to choose my favorite topics, which are high yielding topics, uh, then they are going to be uh, the following. Neurocutaneous syndromes, neurofibromatosis, type 1, type 2, von hippel lindau syndrome, Sturge-Weber syndrome, tuber tuber tuberous sclerosis, uh, FAP syndrome. All of these short topics with lots of, uh, they have lots of little, little terms, you know, shagreen patches and uh, what is a cafe ole spot and number of cafe ole spots. They are a favorite, absolute MCQ favorite. Second, remember the WHO classification really well. What's great about neurosurgery, neuro-onco, every other field has to has to read uh, TNM grading, which was always horrible. I mean, there's this T0, N0, M1, and T0, M, M2, and there, then that's grade 1, grade 2. We don't have staging. We have grading. And we have genetic classifications, which have now become ex extremely important. So read the WHO classification very well. Then also divide uh, divide sessions. Uh, di sorry, divide uh, your your tables. Make a list of the important tables to remember just the day before your exam, including, for example, House and Brackman grade for LMN uh, facial palsy grading for uh, uh, for uh, you know uh, acoustic schwannomas or whatever, or even Bell's palsy. Fisher grade uh, for uh, CT grading grading of SAH. Uh, uh, Hunt and Hess grade for SAH, clinical grade, WHO, WFNS grade for SAH, uh, the Ashworth classification for motor power and spasticity, uh, MRC grading for motor uh, for motor power. These are many tables that in the last moment you will you'll be confused. Oh, is this grade one? Is this power one? Is it power two? You need to be able to rapidly revise those tables. So make a list of those tables, definitely. Uh, other important topics. So these are not the other topics are not less important, but these are high yielding topics with very very short times. Okay, understand uh, your anatomy, neuroanatomy really well. Neuroanatomy, you don't need everything. What you need is you need good vascular anatomy. What is M1, M2, M3, M4, whatever is A1, A2, A3, A4. You need really good brainstem uh, sections. You need to know what Diane Keflin, Talen Keflin, basic parts. You need to know the Broadman's uh, uh, areas. Uh, which is Wernick's area, which is uh, Broca's area, which is the uh, occipital area, what is the calcarine sulcus, and stuff like that. So if you nail down your anatomy and a few physiological concepts, ICP you have to do really well. Second, you, you need to do really well is some specific things like who made EEG, what are the different kinds of EEG waves. These are very short topics, but they're very high yielding. They'll definitely be asked. Every time there is a name or a term in something, it'll come as an MCQ essentially so uh, the greenberg first four or five chapters right those are really really good you have to nail them and among tumors who classification among uh, uh, hemorrh uh, hemorrhages you need to know the gradings and the tables in uh, fish in uh, in sh uh, same thing uh, uh, in spine you need to know the localization of the vertebral column uh, if there is a pivd of l45 then where is the pain or where is the radical that will be affected you need to know that physiological aspect much more than the operative aspect and uh, uh, so, you know, in, in each topic, there are these high yielding parts. Definitely revise them one day before. Okay, we have another question. I'm in my third year MS, sir. I have done my rotation in neuro. I am very much inclined towards neuro. What do you suggest at this point of time? So if you're very much inclined in neuro, what I suggest is that you start uh, uh, reading uh, Greenberg. Because uh, at this point of time, don't go after the MCQs because uh, you'll be conflicted. You'll have to do your uh, MS final exam which will be filled with vivas and it will be intense, it will be intention. Uh, do your, uh, read Sebastian, uh, okay, for your general surgery, because I made the mistake of reading, uh, okay, a lot of really, you know, not so great books for general surgery, which I did not repeat as a neurosurgeon. I read great books in neurosurgery. Sebastian is the standard textbook from which I think even for uh, neurosurgery exams, every time there was a general surgery based question, uh, I found it from Sebastian. Although it's very detailed, Sebastian is a very, very difficult textbook to master, but uh, read Sebastian for your finals in general surgery. Also start, just start giving a reading to Greenberg. The reason is actually Greenberg is a very dry book. It's a boring book. So what you need to do with Greenberg is uh, start with the neuroanatomy, neurophysiology section and master those. Uh, when you get to the tumors, you know, Greenberg gets very dry. You know, there'll be a tumor, there'll be a number of lists of tumors. In this, you will see chicken wire pattern. In this, uh, you will see 1P19Q codeletion and stuff like that. Instead, go to YouTube. 
uh, YouTube was not great when I was preparing. Go to YouTube and find out, uh, uh, you know, operative. Just see how operations are done on oligodendrogramas. Go see how that tumor is done. That piques your interest. That keeps it less dry. So then, you know, you create a pattern for yourself and start making your own notes. Start making notes that, you know, especially when there's a term, ODG, oligodendroglioma, chicken wire pattern, honeycomb pattern, calcifications uh, on CT. Just make five terms so you can quickly revise them. So that way you'll finish your MS general surgery exam final and you have some basic preparation. And if you can take, if you have a few more months, you can hone in on that preparation and get to that level I've been talking about, that baseline level in which you need to know at least these base, at least this must know knowledge to start ranking. And you may never know, you might get lucky in your exam and even with much less knowledge than what many senior people have, many people who've been preparing for longer have, you can place rank one, you never know. Okay, uh, do you recommend studying SWEET? So uh, Schmidick and Sweet is an operative textbook. So I do not recommend studying uh, Schmidick and Sweet uh, for your super specialty entrance exams. The reason is that operative neurosurgery actually has not been given so much importance in your MCQs. That is a totally different, uh, 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 you know, uh, study that is mainly important for your final MCH exams and for becoming a neurosurgeon ultimately. Second problem is Schmidick and Sweet is a very large textbook that doesn't actually cover a lot of the operative portion that we practically do in India. So Schmidick has a lot of concepts. So, but uh, you know, uh, what we do, the way we operate in India, uh, we are, believe me, we are very state of the art, but we depend a lot on a number of operative papers and research that is being published in journals. So in the neuro in the super specialty uh, stage, there is no one textbook that will say, do this. Even when we read textbook chapters, you will slowly realize that the person writing the chapter is very important. And your boss might not even agree with the person who's written the chapter. Might even be, have an ego battle with that person because it's a small community. It's not a very large community. So Schmidt, definitely not sweet. You can you can uh, read, uh, uh, definitely read Neurophysiology and Neuroanatomy from Snell. Snell is a good book to read to start understanding neuroanatomy, particularly cross sections of the brain and uh, tracks that go through. Uh, Okay, thanks. Thanks for uh, this. A thank you from Sagar. I hope Rahul, uh, I've answered your question on Sweet. Uh, master the other books. You won't have time, very honestly. If you're doing the other books properly, if you're doing Greenberg well or Ramurthy and Tandon well, if you're doing uh, Snell's Neuroanatomy well, De Jong is a really nice book. Okay, but De Jong is a bit complex. So uh, my suggestion is that uh, uh, read De Jong for the, its tract localization. The, when you study the tracts, you no know, cortical spinal tract. You study the lateral spinothalamic tract and you read the sections. You don't have to go into detailed concepts like uh, hemiparesis cruciate. I've mentioned some of these in my marrow series, but the important ones only. You don't have to go into very much uh, detailed concepts, but there is one, some important uh, must-know type of, uh, you know, uh, tables in, in, in uh, Dijon. And Dijon is a very good textbook for your, uh, for your neurological aspect and neurological examination. So great. I, I'm hoping uh, all of you had a good a good session. I'm really thankful for your uh, questions and uh, best of luck for your exams. And get in touch with me anytime. Uh, I love I love teaching and I love teaching neurosurgery. When you become when you get through this entrance exam, you should believe me. Entrance exams are not a test of your knowledge. Again, again, I'm telling you that I'm telling you this because just in case you don't make it, please don't feel that this is because you have less knowledge very knowledgeable people don't make it in entrances and people who with only half knowledge but very focused knowledge actually crack their entrances this is this i've learned the hard way believe me through all the exams i've given so once you do get into your residency i'm always available even before that i'm always available for questions you can uh, you can get my email address from uh, it's nishantesy at gmail.com you can get it from you can get it from the marrow team and uh, you can get in touch with me for any guidance that you'd like and uh, uh, I'm always here for you. Uh, best of luck. And I'll hope to see you on this side of the uh, fence. Okay, one more thing. So does institute really matter in the long run? So I, I asked, I, in my final sort of little summary, I told you this. Institute does matter. But in within an institute, luck matters a lot. So don't leave a seat that is well earned because you think you'll get into a better institute. For example, I entered PGI when the previous HOD, who was a terror, for 10 years he was HOD, he was a terror, 
and I do not believe uh, he really helped the cause of PGI, had just retired. The three months after he retired when I joined, the present HOD transformed the institute. He is one of the greatest neurosurgeons that I respect, Dr. S.K. Gupta. He transformed it and he converted it. Now it is one of the best institutes for both surgical work and concepts. AIMS, you, if your boss is uh, someone who won't give you surgery, you won't get surgery. I mean, you, you rotate between units. But, uh, you know, there is a lot, there's a lot of SRs and a lot of consultants. On the other hand, my friend in, uh, in, uh, in Calcutta has done four times the amount of surgical work. Conceptually and in terms of overall exposure to the different kind of surgeries, he was behind people from uh, central institutes. But surgical hand-wise, he can go into any institute and operate anything. And you already know this. This the same thing happens in general surgery. Big institutes and big names often don't have a lot of surgical work. But uh, what I want to say is that get through your MCH and then whatever you're lacking in, Join an institute, even as a uh, non-academic at a senior SR position, but you'll be consultant, obviously. Join there to make up that deficit. So if you've not done enough cutting, join a high volume center where there is no one above you or very few people above you, like Negrims. Negrims is a very good institute. Loknaik is a very good institute to hone your hand. If you think you don't have concepts, if you think you have a good hand, you have done the volume, but your concepts and exposures are not good. Even private hospitals today with a great, like Nanavati, Lilavati, uh, Paris, where I worked, uh, which is what I did, Medanta, Artemis, these are places where you'll see the whole gamut and range of procedures. It's done in a private setup with very great care. And you'll you'll you can do fellowships. Fellowships are very openly available. You can do uh, you know extended SR ships in uh, in central institutes and see what's going on. Just see the exposure of what's going on. So you can make up the deficit later. Don't give up your seat because of an institute. Is Bradley recommend to go through? No, don't don't go through Bradley. <laughs> don't I would not uh, recommend it. Uh, I mean, if you're if you're asking for Shui Sweet and Bradley, then you should have been done with your other uh, with your with your other books. You your Greenberg should be on your fingertips. Then your Ramurthy and Tandon, which is similar but more boring, uh, should be on your fingertips. Your uh, neurological localization should be. If you want to go in for a book after Dijon, if you've mastered Dijon, that would be Bradzi. Uh, and uh, uh, I would not recommend Bradley as a book uh, as such. Yeah, honestly, Rahul, you won't have the time. Uh, believe me. You will just need to crack the exam and then start your residency. <laughs> believe me. And that you will be whipped so much that uh, you, won't have, you won't read through your three years. Believe me. Until your exam comes. Finally. So yeah, uh, thanks for your questions. I hope you enjoyed the session and uh, hope to do this soon. Do give me recommendations on topics. Uh, just email Marrow or give a feedback on what you would like to listen to. Uh, tumors, vascular, uh, neurocutaneous syndromes, um, spine, uh, pediatric neurosurgery, endoscopy, hydrocephalus. Uh, CSF dynamics. There are many, many topics. Neurological localization. Uh, you know, uh, tests for neurological localization, uh, the anatomy of the brain and the spine, uh, the anatomical concepts, how to remember those anatomical concepts easier and better. I could use a skull and I can show them to you. Uh, operative neurosurgery, if you want an interesting talk, I love, that's my favorite topic. And sadly, it's not given as much, not sadly, expectedly, it's been given, not given as much importance as uh, other topics because you don't expect people at your level to understand the surgical aspects but if you want to get a good overview of how we actually do neurosurgery both in terms of spinal laminectomies or uh, cranial approaches different types of craniotomies how we approach tumors what they look like i can even add uh, my own operative videos to the topic and uh, that will be very interesting for you um, make you feel more like a neurosurgeon uh, thanks for the session. I hope you all, uh, you guys all enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, Maro, for uh, allowing me this uh, opportunity to really connect with the people uh, listening. Uh, so uh, thanks and uh, namaste.